Hello everyone, I'm Mark Feiner, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this very special event today. As most of you know, sales of vinyl records have experienced a remarkable resurgence over the past few years. But well, what's been driving all of this? To find that out, early last year, the research firm Music Watch commissioned a special study that was sponsored by the RIAA, Music Biz Association, and the Record Store Day people. This was all designed to undertake and develop what's become a very piece of landmark research. Over 1,400 buyers between the ages of 13 and 70 were surveyed. And while a number of insights emerged from this, perhaps the most significant thing we learned is that many vinyl buyers, particularly Gen Zs and millennials, had little or no understanding about the implications of cleaning and protecting their valuable record collection. So to discuss the implications of this, we've assembled today a very impressive panel of vinyl cleaning experts. And later in this session, we'll even have time to take some questions from all of you in the audience. However, to moderate this panel, there was really only one person to choose. For nearly four decades, Michael Fremer has been reviewing music recordings, turntables, and high-end audio equipment as a contributing editor to Stereophile and The Absolute Sound. And over the years, Michael has been recognized on a global basis for his insights in this area. He's also a founder and editor of his own publication called The Tracking Angle which focuses on vinyl listening and the user experience. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce my favorite vinyl icon, Michael Fremer. Thank you so much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. I have three minutes to tell you about the history of vinyl, which is, you know, three minutes is not enough, but I'm gonna get right to it. So before there was vinyl, there were 78s, and there were other, uh, even earlier formats. This is an, called an Edison diamond disc, and this came out in about 1918. And this cost $1.50 in 1918, which is about $32 now. So the prices of records now is really not excessive. Now I'm gonna move right on to uh, the invention of the uh, LP. And the LP was invented by uh, Peter Goldmark. And in 1948, Columbia Records came out with the first LP. This is not the very first, but it's part of the same series of, uh, of LPs on the Masterworks label. And this is Nate Milstein with Tchaikovsky, but it was Mendelssohn that was the first one. And then um, there, was a, there was a format war between RCA and Columbia. And RCA had invented the seven inch disc with the big hole before the war, but the war got in the way of it coming out and they couldn't really get it out till after that. And so in 1954, uh, RCA capitulated and they came out with uh, a 12 inch LP. And this is one that, that lets people hear the difference between high fidelity and, uh, and 78s. 78s continued for a very long time and uh, till in, in, in fact, the Beatles were released on 78 in India, but that's a whole nother story. Um, this is my very first single. It's the Glowworm by the Mills Brothers. And I just want you to know that if you take care of your records, they will outlive you. This is my very first, I bought it when I was four years old. Um, I have here Hound Dog and Don't Be Cruel by Elvis Presley, uh, my first Elvis Presley record. Uh, we have 10 inch, vinyl uh, LPs that were put up by Columbia and a variety of other labels before everybody agreed to the 12 inch format. And this is an example of a 45 that you all know. This is Bobby Darren's Mac the Knife, which is the first 45 I ever bought. And I still have it and it still sounds great. And here's the first LP that I ever bought, the Kingston Trio at large, still sounds great. Um, stereo happened in 1958 and Sidney Fry from Audio Fidelity introduced the first this is not the first one, but he introduced the first stereo LP, which was a very considerable uh, event. And RCA followed up with uh, stereo demo records like Sounds in Space. So that is a very short and concise history in a few minutes of uh, the invention of the LP from the beginning uh, with the cylinder to today. So now let me... Uh, introduce our vinyl experts. So 
Uh, we have Jeff Coates, who is the marketing director of Fine Sounds America. Jeff, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Pleasure to be here. We have Dr. Charles Kermis, founder and CEO of Kermis Audio. We have uh, Mark Marwini, president of Spin Clean International. Hi, now, Michael. we've invited these three people here because they each have a different way of cleaning records, from a basic cleaning record way that Mark's going to talk about, to uh, the vacuum system that many of you are familiar with that Jeff is going to talk about. And finally, the cavitation-based uh, type of machine that Charles is going to talk about. They are not here to sell their products. They are here to tell you about the various ways that records can be cleaned. And when I hear people say, oh, you can clean records, people don't know about this. They don't. That's a problem we have to face in this business. It's like, oh, you mean you can clean your glasses? I had no idea. So, uh, the important thing that we have to realize is that a lot of young people are buying records now and they're all excited about it, but they don't know the first thing about handling, cleaning, and taking care of their records. And that is what we're going to try to discuss today and talk about. So I think we're actually running ahead of schedule, which is a good thing. So Mark, why don't you begin by talking about uh, the kind of system that you are uh, making and selling? No prices, please. So spin clean was the category originator of the manual bath type unit back in 1975. And our unit is just tried and true over the years, basically a manual based uh, uh, system that cleans your records. Uh, we have, uh, there's velvet brushes in the, uh, in the basin that uh, combined with distilled water and our concentrated cleaning solution, which gets poured in over the brushes, basically creates a bath that allows you to clean up to 40 records manually. And uh, we also have adjustable rollers in our unit. So it's one of the few that's adjustable for cleaning albums, 45s and 78s. And it's as, simply, as simple as inserting a record in our unit, spinning it three times clockwise, three times counterclockwise. And then when you're completed, cleaning, you remove the, the record from the basin and you dry it off with one of our 100% cotton lint-free cloths. So the, the benefit of this particular process is that it's it's relatively inexpensive. Correct. And it's, and it's easy to use. Are there any downsides to this process? Well, the manual dry if you want to look at it that way, but it's uh, all part of what we do at the price point that we're at. I see. And do you go to do you go to places and introduce this to store owners or how do you, how do you promote this? Well, we've been around for so many years. I mean, we're we're sold in over 400 record stores in the United States and then we do, you know, distribution all over the world. Excellent. I think we're running ahead of schedule, which is good. So let's go right to Jeff. Now, Jeff, you are going to talk about what has become the most popular uh, method of cleaning records with a machine, and that's the vacuum-based machine. And you're going to talk about the kind of vacuum machine that uses a velvet lip type uh, situation. There's another kind that we're not talking about, so I'm just going to go over that for a second. That's one that uses a string type cleaner, which is quiet and has it takes a long time to clean. And uh, that's an option that people should consider that's not being discussed here because we only have time for three people. So talk about sure. what you are doing. Sure, absolutely. Well, thank you. So we're kind of that next step in terms of a semi-automatic process. Um, you don't have to manually rotate the record, uh, but you do still have to manually apply the fluid. So the idea with one of our vacuum cleaning systems, and we started these back in 2016. Uh, project's been around since 1991 and been using a lot of other people's cleaners for many years, actually distributing the spin clean in a lot of uh, Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, but in 2016, we introduced our own vacuum type system. So the idea with something like this is you manually apply the fluid to the surface of the record. And what we're trying to do is use the brush that comes with it to get as much of the dirt and grime and things that are in the grooves up into suspension so that then we can start that vacuum. It's going to rotate uh, the platter around a couple of, usually three times counterclockwise, three times clockwise, and it's going to get almost all of the dirt and grime, grime off the surface um, and in a lot of what's down in the grooves of that record. 
And you're one of the companies that you also make a, a liquid to put on the record? We do. Yeah. Uh, and we actually, we started originally, it was a 10 or 15 to one. Uh, you'd combine it with, uh, with distilled water. Uh, so we were using a non-topic non -topic surficant, uh, basically an orange terpene based uh, product. And if anybody's interested, we've got the whole, uh, Dr. Kermis, and you'll know better than we uh, for the, the chemical properties of this. Uh, but it's a, yeah, it's a very effective. So the idea is it's nothing that's going to actually negatively impact the surface of the, the shellac or the LP, uh, but it's going to actually be able to mild solvent to be able to get down into the grooves and release some of that dirt and grime that's on the surface of the record. Great. And one of the issues I think we have is that a lot of people are making their own fluids and they don't know what they're doing. And I've, I've seen yeah. some terrible fluids being made and people who are not chemists and don't know what they're doing, recommending things online or saying, put wood glue all, all over your record. And is all, please, I just want to say, buy fl fluids are not that expensive. Buy a, a recommended fluid that's manufactured by someone who knows what they're doing. Don't listen to anybody online telling you to homebrew your own using all kinds of chemicals, some of which are not good for records is very, very important. And you know, one of the reasons that vinyl is making a comeback among young people is they they like to uh, bond with the artists that they love. And the artist makes a record and says, here is 12 songs I've put together, six on a side. And the consumer can buy that and know that they're supporting the artist and also have a special uh, keepsake that the artist is presenting to them. And those records will last a lifetime. I've been collecting records for 72 years and my records still sound great. And I still sound great, which is a good thing too. All right. So that, now that's, I would absolutely just to kind of to add a little on that. Uh, so many of these people that are buying brand new records today, it's just keep that in mind. You know, you're buying a $30, $40 special pressing, you know, having a proper cleaner in place to get a lifetime of use out of that record. Well, it might out of the gate seem like kind of expensive, but when you look at a 50 or 60 or 70 year listening, uh, is a really good investment. Yes, if you take care of them and learn how to remove them from the jacket without pinching your fingers. Don't pinch your fingers on the edge of the record. That's a very bad thing to do. So there are ways of, of explaining all this to people. It could take a long time. We don't have that kind of time. Now, Charles Kermis, you uh, have developed a cavitation-based machine. So would you explain the principles of cavitation and how these machines work? Uh, very good, Michael. Well, greetings, everyone. Uh, what Michael just went over was very important to see the lineage of, uh, of records. And I just wanted to show this here. This is where records actually come from. They're stamped uh, by side A and B squeezing a biscuit. So this is part of the process that we discovered uh, that created a problem where your needle wasn't actually playing uh, the reflection of the stamper, but actually riding on the re release agent or the pressing oil. Uh, and the pressing oil, as Michael has mentioned before, isn't where someone sprays PAM on these stampers. It actually comes out and surfaces onto the record uh, in the process of the press, and it allows the record to pop out. And discovered where here I am, I'm playing records, and I hear a brand, a brand new record gives me a pop at the edge of the record. It's because as the records cool down, this pressing oil that was actually discovered by the Shore brothers in the 70s uh, that saw dirt and dust at the factory land on that pressing oil. And uh, getting back to ultrasonics, uh, I myself have used the VPI 16.1. I, I was uh, selling audio equipment when I was in high school. I have actually still like the manual spin clean that Mark was talking about because it's mechanical where I'm doing a Let's little- Let's just talk about cavitation, Charles. Let's yeah. just talk about cavitation, okay. Okay, so cavitation. Uh, there's a lot of misnomers on cavitation where people are building their own cavitation systems, uh, buying various machines on the website and then thinking they can suspend a record inside a fluid and have cavitation occur. Most of the definitions of cavitation is incorrect. What happens is an ultrasonic machine should have a basin made out of metal. It has transducers, you can call them speakers if you want, that are excited by an amplifier, in this case, a sonic generator, which then vibrates water, water rises, and it creates micro bubbles. And these micro bubbles, as they rise, they implode and create a vacuum. They don't hit the record. They actually are attracted to the record that the bubbles implode and create a vacuum. And in our discovery, we found out even in our machine, if I don't do something to the record, 
I can keep a record in a machine for 30 hours or 30 days, and I will not be able to remove the pressing oil because the record and the water with or without a solution inside repels. So we spent 13 years in learning about how records are made and understanding the triboelectric table of charges, which says plastic and vinyl repel. So in our process, we actually have to spray the record which changes the charge of the record to be opposite to the water. We then in the first cycle or two, remove whatever films we've left over from other cleaning processes. Some are better than others. And as the record turns, we lose that charge. So unfortunately you have to spray again, apply the charge to the record. And again, it's not a cleaning agent. It aids the cavitation to then remove finally the pressing oil and that, if you want that fused piece of dust, that's so, fused. So, Charles, so that's that's a restoration uh, process. But you could clean a record in a cavitation machine by just putting it in there and cavitating for a few minutes, and you you can get a cleaning process going that's comparable to other methods, but it's somewhat better, maybe or or easier. But one thing I didn't I didn't ask Jeff about the disadvantages of the brush type vacuum system. And that would be that it creates a static charge because there's a lot of rubbing. So that's the one disadvantage. The, the disadvantage of your particular system is that it takes a lot of time to do the complete uh, processing and restoration of a record. Is there a disadvantage to the actual just cavitating in plain water? Is there any disadvantage to that? Uh, unfortunately, there is uh, the triboelectric table of charges. I didn't invent it. It states. I know. But I'm, let's let's go past that. Though. I don't. I don't want. I just okay. want to talk about the basic process. I realize that your, yours it, is. It does leave. It does leave a film. You saw that this weekend, where you processed right. records, and you asked me to determine which one was processed by Kermis, which by some right. other machine. Those machines soften materials, and because they air dry, they then leave another coating on there. So you're hiding the pops that you're really gumming up your needle if there's a severe enough coating on that record. Okay. Okay. Your, your process takes a long time to do. I just did one last night. It takes 20 minutes and it does a great job, but that's a whole nother story. So yeah, I want everybody to come back now. <laughs> Let's get everybody to come back now. And I want to talk about how we are promoting what we do to the general public. So, uh, so Mark, you can come back now. And uh, Jeff can come back now, okay. So we sort of touched on that, but so Mark, aside from uh, advertising, are you, is there anywhere that you're proselytizing record cleaning to, to the general population or to record store owners or? Yeah, we, we promote it to all. We just uh, actually came out with a 15 page technical white paper on called vinyl records in the spin clean record care system. And basically it, it goes through and explains the process of how records are recorded and what the best way to clean them is, the different types of cleaners that are out there. You know, obviously we're a manual based record cleaner and we're very effective at removing dirt, grease, grime, fingerprints, smoke film, any oily materials that were left after the pressing for new records. And what, one of the coolest things about our product is we have an encapsulating mechanism that is built into our cleaning solution that sinks the dirt to the bottom of the basin and doesn't get redeposited back on your records. And many people over the years have always asked, why is Spin Clean yellow? Well, the reason that we're yellow is so when you're done cleaning your records, you can see all the crud in the bottom of the basin and verify, wow, look at that, this thing really works. Yes, it does work because I've, I've reviewed uh, that product and it does work and it does a good job. And it's like the gateway drug to record cleaning. It gets people to see the value of cleaning records. And, you know, people take a new record out of a jacket and they see it's dirty. And they go, why is my new record dirty? Because pressing plants are dirty rooms. They're not clean rooms. So it's, it's important to clean even new records. Yeah, so, Jeff, what are, you, what are you doing? What is Project doing to... Uh, promote uh, record cleaning and to promote your your products to consumers 
Absolutely. Well, I mean, first, I mean, I know we're all spending a lot of time on social media. That's uh, that's probably the most effective way for us to get out to the greatest number of people. Um, however, we do a lot of in-stores, both at our dealers, our hi-fi dealers, and at record stores. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is drop into one of the record stores. We've got a great one here in Austin, Texas. I spend a lot of time at um, and kind of do a Saturday. So we'll come in, clean the used stuff, help them out, just kind of take people through. This is how you actually the process of handling and cleaning a record. Um, we're even going out and we'll be doing a lot of demonstrations at a record convention uh, down here over a couple of days. And again, that's shocking to me. Some of these folks that come in that are collecting these multiple thousand dollar records are hunting them down. And a lot of them, it's just the way they're handling them and what they're actually carrying them around in. It's just cringeworthy. It is. So it's really cool to be able to get out there and show people how to properly handle and care for uh, and clean a record. And we also have to talk about how uh, many of these dealers are unscrupulous and they're spraying their records with lighter fluid and all kinds of things <laughs> to make them look shiny and new when they're not. And um, I think it's important to get the word out to consumers to look at records yeah. carefully to understand if they look really shiny to figure out why they look shiny. But that's a whole nother subject for a whole nother time. So, Charles, I know you you are always at hi-fi shows uh, with your lab coat, cleaning records and demonstrating what you do, which is a great thing because it's it's costly to go to a show and to do what you do. What Are you doing anything else that we don't know about behind the yeah, scenes? We, yeah, we do record shows globally. Uh, we do a record fair every weekend somewhere in England. Uh, we also reach out to non-record events. Uh, we have uh, social media out there that are bringing in people that are musicians uh, so we're, you know, people that uh, subscribe to magazines relating to guitars, instruments, electronics, and those are people all that are entering the hobby because they're buying records. So we're now moving our advertising into larger areas that are not destined to audiophiles, because most of the folks already know us. You're going to see smaller ads in, you know, the audio industry magazines, and now larger ads into the ones that deal with recording studios uh, you know, the uh, life, uh, lifestyle magazines, and so on to say that you need to do something to your records. Good point. So, uh, Mark, if you were if you were to ask a consumer who owns your product, what their experience is with using it, what would they tell you? And I'm sure you've asked them in, in the past. So what do they tell you? Well, Michael, because we've been around for almost five decades, we uh, have accumulated a tremendous amount of positive reviews. And obviously on our Facebook page, we get day-to-day -day feedback from our customers. And everybody loves the machine because it's just so simple and it's an easy process. It's quick, it's quiet, and it's very effective. And it uses distilled water along with uh, what you provide? Right. Yeah, we use distilled water and then we have a concentrated cleaning solution that cleans or that pours over the brushes and dilutes into the bath. And each time you create a bath, you can clean anywhere from 20 to 40 to records, depending on how dirty your vinyl is. To begin with, right. But you, you suggest people when they buy new records to clean them as well, right? Because they Correct. come out of the- Yeah, definitely, the because there's an oily film that's on the records from the pressing procedure, sure. And do you discuss uh, stylus hygiene at all with people? Because I know some people just never clean their stylus and they don't realize the damage that can do to the stylus and to the records. Sure, and the dirtier your records are, the more you need to clean your stylus. But yeah, we sell a lot of uh, stylus cleaning brushes and there's, there's all types of different methods for cleaning a, a record stylus. Just a brief interruption, esteemed viewers. As you may know, I'm Tom Martin, Chief Content Officer of The Absolute Sound. We have a new product. It's on the Substack platform, and we're going to do some interesting things with Substack, first of which is reader questions and answers. Each Monday, readers will submit questions, we'll pick the most interesting ones, and we'll answer the questions on Friday. We'll also have early access to articles and special blogs that don't appear anywhere else. We hope you'll join us. It's only a cost of a cup of coffee per month. Just check on the screen or in the show notes below. Thanks. And now back to the show. So Jeff, when you, uh, when you talk to consumers about your, your machines and your process, uh, what do you hear from them? Well, I mean, it's always a little strange to use a vacuum cleaner in a box. So that first time somebody runs it, it's like, wow, okay, this is not particularly quiet, but boy, is it effective. 
Um, yeah. And that's really a big thing. You know, it's very fast. It literally, we recommend three rotations, both clockwise and anti-clockwise. Um, takes just a couple of minutes to clean a side of a record. And one of the advantages to this is when we're done, as long as we've got good new felt, uh, new felt brushes and the, and we're in good shape, the record is dry when you're finished. So you don't have to then figure out how to, where am I going to place it to get it dry over the next few minutes? And do you tell, do you recommend people that they change those velvet brushes on a regular basis and that they clean them on a regular basis? Absolutely. Certainly clean them. And I recommend it even every couple of, you know, every couple of uses, I'll just go through and and give them a little brush. Uh, But yeah, we, they're very easily replaceable. You know, we, you can pick up replacements from you know any hi-fi dealer record store uh, but that's something that's uh yeah definitely and you've got a new machine out that i saw at exponent that's quieter than the previous machines where you could actually talk to somebody while you're cleaning a record which, which right? is yeah they've gotten better so this is our third generation uh each generation has gotten a little bit better uh from a from an operational standpoint they are quieter internally um and we now we've replaced the screw down cap uh, clamp with a really very durable and very effective uh, rare earth magnet magnetic clamp. So that protects the, the surface of the label. So if you're cleaning your records, you don't get that fluid leaching onto the label surface and ruining your beautiful record label. Uh, but that makes it even easier to operate. Yeah. So now, Charles, I, I've been your nemesis for uh, for many years because I've been qu- I've questioned uh, w- what you do, and and you've always come back and proven what you do. And yours is the most complicated process that to to really restore a record by your process it takes about 20 minutes is that is that true it takes 18 to 25 minutes to do four records simultaneously and something to add the records come out virtually dry and that's what a sonic should do if they've actually done some cleaning but yes Yes. uh, but once it's done you do not have to repeat it again because the pressing oil is gone Yes, and most of the people that I talk to who uh, who buy your machine and go through that whole rigmarole come out of it saying, you know what, I hear the difference between just cleaning a record and then and restoring it because because it definitely works through all of what you have to do to do that. Yeah, it even makes the entry level system sound good. It's like Robert Grossman said. Uh, he said surface noise was reduced, background silence was darker, deeper sense of space while music could be uh, uh, more clearly heard. Silent gaps between tracks sometimes fooled me into thinking the record somehow ended early and measured. Does anybody complain? Yeah. Does anybody complain? to four dB gain. Does anybody complain about cleaning records with your system? We well, have the only complaint. The only complaints I've heard. Any, yeah, we have not had any complaints except one person that said they broke a record in half which is impossible to do. It was on Steve Hoffman's forum or whatever. And when you have custodians like Lowell Graham saying it's like opening up a window, we're the only manufacturer that guarantees you 1.3 dB gain and three to four dB gain, depending on the provenance of record. Well, and today I will will say if you don't follow through the process completely and only go halfway, it, it can create a mess. You have to follow through the whole process. But cleaning records so any any of these ways of cleaning records is beneficial to your records and to your stylus and to the longevity of your records that that's the most important thing for people to understand and uh and and you only have to clean a record with any of these uh techniques once really and then your records should stay clean for quite some period of time all right so we're moving along very very well and uh does anybody have anything else they would like to add about their particular machines or their particular process before uh, Mark comes back and uh, gives us questions from people that are watching? Yes, Charles. I like Mark's spin clean. I still have it. Uh, I think uh, it's because you're also using a little mechanical with your hand and you're also drawing mechanically and not with air or vacuum and i recommend still his product for those people that cannot afford a kermis okay okay we get sorry it's it's all based on science yeah we get comments all the time that you know even if you own and have one of the higher dollar record cleaning machines you need to still have a spin clean just for the quick and easy cleaning because of how much quicker it is to do the whole process 
and it, it just becomes a supplement and a faster one at that. Yep. Yeah, for me, I, I find that there's a nice progression here. And this is kind of what I talk to collectors out there. It seems everybody started with a manual system, a spin clean type. Uh, and that's a big step up from just a basic brush. I mean, it huge difference using a wet bath type cleaner. Uh, but I think you get to that point, if you're retreat, trying to do 15, 20 records at a go, uh, I think a you know, vacuum assisted, motor assisted system does have a nice, it certainly has a place. Um, I haven't quite gotten to the place uh, for one of Mr. Kermis's systems, but you know, I know for the archivists out there and the real perfectionists, I've heard a lot of good things. Yeah, and then I, I will mention the one type of machine we haven't talked about, which is the string-based machine that was invented by Keith Monks, who is no longer with us, but his son is doing it. And this is a, a process by which you put fluid on the record, and then the vacuum is in a little, like a, a, a tone arm, and there's a piece of thread that separates the vacuum from the record so it doesn't just stick to it, and it rotates across the record and picks up all the liquid, and then when it's finished, you move the string to a, a fresh thread. It's, it's a very quiet and good system, another system worth uh, considering. And I wanted to give everybody their due. And he's still making those kinds of machines. So there's many of ways of doing this. And they're all beneficial and they're all useful. And the important thing is to use one of them and not none of them. That's what's important. So we're moving along at a pretty good pace because I'm a nervous New Yorker and I move fast. So uh, Mark, are you there? And can you... Uh, start asking the panelists any questions that we've gotten or are we doing such a good job that there are no questions is that possible actually michael that... michael you guys are doing a great job but we have lots of questions anyway great. so let me begin with one that we receive what steps can be taken to keep mold off your records good question who wants to handle that one I know I that tell, uh, I can tell you that the spin clean is capable of removing mold from a record. If you do get, uh, you know, records from a moldy basement, uh, spin clean will certainly resolve that issue for you. I once was uh, sent a collection. I'm sorry. I was once sent a collection of records from somebody who was in a flood and his records were all ruined. The jackets were ruined. The records seemed to be ruined, but I, I put a steam, a steam cleaner on the records one of those portable steam cleaners and actually restored his records to usability. And uh, that's something to use in, in a desperate situation, but not normally. So Charles, your, your system does deal with mold also, right? Yeah, we remove mold. But what's the question was, how do we protect against mold? What's important is just like where we keep all of our records, keep it in an environment that's at a reasonable temperature, no large swings, it's not up in the attic. We keep it away from humidity. And if it's in a basement, use a dehumidifier to remove that so that you're at around 40% relative humidity. The issue comes from a couple of things. Uh, a lot of sleeves that are used on records are paper. The paper is in contact with the PVC vinyl record. The vinyl record outgasses plasticizer. So that's another issue we have not talked about, which is for another, another day and time. But the combination of that creates with humidity oils on the record, a perfect environment to grow fungus. So you don't want to be in those areas. And all of the systems that are in the marketplace will remove that because they're all surface. And again, when you finish the record, uh, what you do is throw away the paper sleeve if it was paper, except if it had any printing on there like lyrics and you know the, the our EMI's next record coming up of Elvis Presley. Use a little yellow sticky note, write the name of the album, shove that sleeve with all the other dirty sleeves so you can sell it as a combination if you do resell the record, and then just replace it with an HDPE three or four mil sleeve that has alkaline paper in the sandwich, not uh, rice paper. Because if you nick the rice paper, we'll start the process again if you're in a humid environment. Yeah, and, and that's a very, very important point. Once you've gone through the process of cleaning a record, you don't want to put it back in a paper sleeve, and you definitely don't want to put it back in the original polyethylene sleeves that were uh, that were sold in, in the 1960s. And those records can be very pl problematic because the polyethylene leaches onto the onto the uh, record itself. So you know th this kind of thing, you want to get rid of these. Why do I still have this? just to show you what it looks like. Don't, don't use those. So that's another part of cleaning. And also put the opening up so the dust doesn't get in. It may be a little more difficult. So all of these things 
will help your records last outlast you and in and still sounding good records do not wear out if you take care of them and play them back properly we, we know that for a fact so michael okay, we have another question yes. related to the cleaning process and it's in regards to fluids is it recommended or even preferable to mix different brands of fluids between one process and another i guess I I think all of us agree, no. And I think we all agree, home-brewed cleaning fluids that you see on the internet are best to be avoided. And if you're buying uh, fluids from one of the manufacturers who makes them and makes a living at that, find out what's in it as well and find out if it's, if it's appropriate for the kind of record that you're trying to clean. And all of the good companies that make these fluids should tell you what's in it. And some people say no alcohol. Some people say a minimal amount of alcohol. Uh, the ones that say 60% alcohol, I would stay away from. Um, you guys have anything to say about that subject? Yeah, can I interject? Uh, the best is ask for the MDS, Material Data Safety Sheet. We all manufacturers need to have that for FedEx, UPS, whatever. In there, it'll have uh, the toxicology of the liquid. You then take that and go Google www, uh, look for PVC chemical compatibility chart and plasticizer compatibility chart. And then you will see whether ethylene oxide will do something to your records, whether ether will do something to your records. And if there is no safety materials data sheet, don't buy the liquid. But do buy, again, trust the manufacturer. Hopefully they are all safe that you really, the MDS is the key to make sure that it's safe for you uh, for health-wise, ingestion-wise. So it, those are the two elements that you need to take a look at. And if someone's selling a concoction, don't use it. And uh, especially very dangerous, we have a couple of people that I've invited from the UK, fellows as alcohol, tergital machines, some of them have pumps in them, they have rubbers. So you also need to consult the neoprene and rubber chemical compatibility chart not to damage those machines. You know, there's a, a many of the machines out there have a lot of people complaining, oh, that's a lousy machine. No, it's not a lousy machine. People have listened to these journalists and making their own concoctions. Bad. Yep, that's, that's really the most important thing. Don't listen to journalists about chemistry. You Except know. from her. No, I would. I I only say what I've learned. I don't. I don't make up my own uh, homebrew nonsense. All right, bigger. good point. Uh, and also, keep your stylus clean and um, get a brush. Use a dry brush and use liquids very, very sparingly and carefully. Many of the styluses are bonded in with a uh, type of glue that can come loose with the wrong solve if a solvent is used in in the liquid. So uh, be careful with all that. And you know, what's happening on that stylus tip is really teeny tiny. If you don't look at it, it can get gummed up pretty quickly and that will damage your records. And, and it won't sound good either once that happens. So you got to pay attention to all these different things. Michael, we have another question related to uh, longtime archived records and the possible use of polyethylene Ziploc bags for them to avoid dust. Is there any opinions, upsides or downsides regarding this? downside only downside only right right charles yep. polyethylene downside bag, bag. only and and remember you know things that are sealed for 30 40 years we have the outgassing of the plasticizer and those polyethylene zip bags are a no-no they will accelerate the coating of perhaps a re restored record if it was restored 40 years ago if i was around it creates problems you you have more films and etching so issues also with some of the Deutsche Grammophon pressings of the 50s. And the way to, to explain that to people who have cars is if you buy a new car and it's in the heat for a bunch of time, all of a sudden there's a, there's a thing on the inside, a film on the inside window of your car, which is outgassing from some of the plastic that's in the car. And that's what happens to the records too. Okay. So, you know, people that say, I'm, I don't want to spend the money on a, on a good inner sleeve. I don't need to. They're just really wasting their time. All of these things matter. And if you really want your records to last, you have to do all of these things. And it's not a ritual. Rituals are for church. This is just things that, you know, it's like I get up in the morning and I, I wash. You know, it's like, well, I'm just going to I don't want to wash my armpit. I'll just cut my arm off. It's, it's, just, it's a, just a pain in the neck to wash my armpits. All these things. 
And once you start doing these off. things, <laughs> once you start doing these things, it's not a ritual and it's just something you do every time you play a record. It's not a big deal. So before anyone cuts any arms off, we have no, a couple more suggesting questions. That. Um, one of these questions came in about other than using vacuum dry, what types of cloth material are best to use when drying records? Microfiber, wouldn't you say? Everybody say that. Mark, what you, is yours a microfiber? Oh, no, we, we've always believed in using 100% cotton lint-free drying towel. And the reason is, is that we found in experiments that basically if you're, if you're using microfiber after or during the drying process, it actually puts a static charge on the record. And as soon as you're done drying the record, it basically makes the record like a magnet. And it just, all the dust just goes right back on the record again. So yeah, hundred percent lint-free cotton is what we recommend. And Charles, is that why you use microfiber, but also recommend people change the charge by spraying a tiny bit of your liquid on a goat's yes, hair? Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. See, yeah. I've yeah. I've learned. I've I've got your whole thing down, right? Grasshopper, very good grasshopper. All right. uh, yeah, we use we use a like a uh, uh, our records come out virtually dry, so we use just uh, the uh, uh, an optician's cloth made by Leica for telescopes, and the water droplets are 110 to 120 microns, so they're not in the groove, they're above the groove. So we use that, and yes, as Michael said, uh, at the end of the process, we take a dry brush at arm's length, a goat hair brush with two shots of spray. It changes the charge uh, of the record when we apply it, and it's not a liquid. So that goes back to Mark again in our process. Okay. We also have a little bit of confusion from some of the viewers about the record cleaning process in terms of, is it a few passes in one direction, and then a few passes in the other direction, or is only one direction enough? And does it vary between systems? I think that's your question, Jeff. Some of these machines do go in both directions. Is that necessary or not? What do you think? I mean, ours goes in, is bi-directional, and I think we have an we have an opportunity to get a lot more of dust and grime that's captured in the grooves as a result. Okay, I agree the same. I mean, I I think that it needs to be you know we recommend three rotations clockwise and three rotations counterclockwise get the best of both worlds. And of course, yeah. cavitation is a whole different process, so it's not you only turn in one direction, right, Charles? Right. On mechanical systems, either the spin clean or the vacuum, uh, except for the monks, because he can't do it the other way around. It's good because you're always swishing something and it, it's there's always a cumulative effect of the of the pooling of the water, uh, especially on a horizontal surface. So going back and forth with those systems, fine. Ultrasonic serve no purpose because of the way that cavitation works. Right. Some, some of the uh, thread type machines do spin in both directions and you do two passes, one in one direction, then you put the the arm on the other side and spin it in the other direction if, if you need to do that so so michael we have time for one last question and sure. this is coming from one of our younger viewers who's new to vinyl and they're asking how can they find out more from these individual companies about the specific products they make is there websites you want to direct them to or a general source of information do each of you guys want to give your website url Mark? Yeah, sure. The The Spin Clean uh, website is www.spinclean.com. It's that simple. And we have tons of go. information on there, our white paper, all the directions on how to use our product. Everything can be found there. And Jeff? So, yeah, projectusa.com. That's P-R-O-J-E-C-T-U-S-A.com. Charles? It's uh, kermisaudio.com in the United States and kermisaudio.net, N-E-T, in Europe. Okay, now I'll, I'll, I'll put a plug in for my DVD, my turntable setup DVD, which also deals with record cleaning. And I made this in 2005, I think, and the experts said it would have a shelf life of three years, unless you're Jane Fonda, these kind of DVDs only sell for a short period of time. It's still in print, it still sells. And it's allowed me to buy a lot of good hi-fi equipment. So th this is all about setting up your turntable. And there's also a PDF in there uh, that you can download from, from the DVD on uh, all the different things we've talked about. And even though it's 15 years old or so, it's still relative. And you can buy this uh, wherever fine uh, DVDs are sold online and every place else. So. 
Well, Michael, I think we're just about out of time. Do you want to summarize on behalf of everybody? Uh, on behalf of everybody, I think we all agree that record hygiene is extremely important, both for the enjoyment of playback and for the preservation of records. And uh, it's a format that is really vital, as we've learned. It, it didn't die. It came back because it's a great way to listen to music, both the length on each side. It's just the ideal amount of time you want to spend with one particular side of music. That's enough. You don't want to listen to the two hours of something, usually. And records are will, will just last forever. You can pass them down generation to generation if you take care of them. You know, if you stream music, that's great. But what happens if you like a particular version of a record and then the company that owns the streaming service decides we're going to do a new remastering and they put that up in place of the one you like and you don't like the new remaster. This way, you buy the record, you own it. Every time you play that record, all of a sudden you don't turn your computer on and see that it's it knows what you played and it gets creepy. No one's watching you when you play your records, you know, unless your camera's on. It's the, to me, it's the best way to listen to music. I've, I've been telling Mark this for how many years, Mark, have I been saying this to you? <laughs> we used Long to play all the time for years we we used to fight about the best format he was into that other silver disc format we would fight at shows now we're on the same team it's the most it's the greatest thing so we all love records we all agree it's a great way to listen to music it will continue to be that for generations to come i'm quite convinced the vinyl is here to stay and if you take care of your records they will outlive you well, michael i want to thank you and the panelists you guys did a great job over the last 45 minutes or so and I want to remind our viewers as well about an upcoming conference called Making Vinyl, which is taking place in Minneapolis on June 7th and 8th. If you really want to get down to some of the issues regarding production, along with vinyl listening, this is a great place to go to. I'll so be there. On of all of us, thank you for your attention today. And keep thank listening. you, everybody. Bye-bye.